I think just listening to you and being with you, this is a real pattern and benchmark of your life, right? Gratitude. There's something to choosing gratefulness. It's so true. Not not just feeling grateful, Very good. choosing it. Man, do you know how many days, you know, when you, the alarm goes off at five, you're like, I don't want to wake up. I don't want to go do this, but we don't have to live by our emotions. We get to choose our convictions of what we believe, of what we want to live for, of what we want to stand for. And that doesn't mean we're perfect with it. We screw up all the time with it. You're going to have some awesome days. Man, I feel like it. I feel grateful. But then you're going to have other days where you don't feel like it. Yep. Uh, I just don't think we should ever give people the false notions that adversity is not a part of life. Mm. It, it is. It's a part of life. I think it's important because we're talking about gratitude and all this stuff. Right. Like, but this you other can still thing. be grateful even in the midst of it, not when it's perfect, because it's never going to be perfect. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Today's special. I have, uh, it's my opinion, but I think it's shared by about 98% of the population. I have the greatest college football player in history in front of me here today. He was also a first-round draft pick in the NFL. He also played professional baseball. He's also a TV icon now, and he's a great force for good and force for God in the world. And it's somebody that I've admired from a distance for many, many years. And so many of you have asked me, can we please listen in on a conversation with you and this man? And so we're going to do it today. Please share it because this is going to be epic. Tim Tebow, welcome to the show, brother. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We have so many friends in I know, common. I know. We passed so many times, and and so it's just great to be here. And heard so many amazing things from all of our mutual friends. Thank you. And uh, I think it, it's it's really cool, and it's quite an honor when uh, so many people talk about you the way that they do. Oh wow! And, thank you. Uh, and so many people that I respect too. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty special because mm -hmm. they don't just talk a, about you as a friend. Mm -hmm. They talk about you as um, someone that's influenced their life. Wow. And that's really cool. Thank you, brother. Well, that really makes me feel wonderful to hear you say that. And, uh, makes me emotional to hear that because that's what, you know, you do in life. You want to help other people. And I've just watched you do this on this platform you've had and handled it so elegantly over the years. And in the beginning as such a young man, I just admired the way, the grace in which you handled really the pressure of being Tim Tebow all these years. And I have a theory about you. I bet you no one's ever asked you a few things. hear it. Well, I'll tell you after I, I have you share the story. I want you to tell my audience your mom's pregnancy story with you and your birth story because I believe that there's a re it's connected to the person you've become and I'll share with you what it is in a minute. So tell my, they most probably would not know this. So about your mom's pregnancy with you. So, um, my parents, um, were and still are missionaries, um, mm -hmm. to the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And we were, uh, my, my mom and dad were living in the Philippines with my four older si siblings. And my dad was preaching in a very remote village. And, um, as he was waiting to, to preach, he began to weep uncontrollably. Um, for all the babies that um, were never given a chance around the world. Mm -hmm. And God put it on his heart that he needs to um, have another baby. And actually by name, Timothy, and, which means honoring God. And um, so he, he finishes preaching that night, travels back to where the family was, and he told my mom, he said, um, you know, um, we need to have a, try to have another baby. God put it on my heart. And she's like, well, God didn't put it on my heart, you know? <laughs> right. We have four. You know? got four of these. And she started praying about it not long after. Um, God really put it on her heart not long after. She became pregnant, um, or at least they thought she was pregnant, and then they thought it was just a tumor. And so actually my first nickname was actually Timmy the Tumor. Oh <laughs> so try getting rid of that one, oh you know? Gosh. And uh, and then they, they realized after a little while it wasn't a tumor, but then there was all these issues um, for the entire nine months. Um over and over and over um, issues of amoeba dysentery that she had and the mm -hmm. placenta wasn't properly attached and all of this. And so the doctor, and they told my, my mom that she needed to have an abortion the whole time pretty much um, or it would cost her her life and my life. Um, mm -hmm. And the doctor that helped her give birth had done it for over 35 years and was an expert at it. And when she gave birth to me, um, she, he just looked at her and said, I've been, I've been doing this for over, um, 35 years and I, I don't know how, um, Timmy made it. It's a, it's the greatest miracle I've ever seen. And, 
And that was the, the day I got to, to meet my mom. And I'm just so grateful that I can sit here and have a conversation with you um, because my mom's courage to, to give me a chance and, mm-hmm. and trust in God. And um, I'm just truly, truly grateful. Brother, that's, that's it's remarkable. And my theory is that in life, this is why your new book's going to help so many people, which we'll talk about in a minute, but in life that there's a story we tell ourselves about who we are. And we start picking up these stories when we're young. And we do everything in our life to be consistent with the story we're telling ourselves. If we're a victim, we mm. live a life where we're consistent with that. If we're, we think we're not smart or not beautiful or not important or not special, we begin to live a life consistent with the story we tell ourselves. And you had the blessing of an amazing family, obviously, that was so God-centered, but also that I've read where your father would tell you that you were a miracle. Yes, he would. And I really believe you started as a young man to live consistently with the story mm. that you believed about yourself. And if you listen to Tim's life, the unbelievable amount of things he's accomplished and lives he's touched, I believe it's because that he's been living consistently with the story he believes about himself. Wow. Um, well, when I was young, my, my parents um, so many times would remind me, hey, mm. You're a miracle, baby. Mm -hmm. God spared you for a reason, Mm -hmm. to have an impact, Mm -hmm. to do something special, to be able to, um, to help so many other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, God didn't create you and spare you, Mm -hmm. um, by happenstance, Mm -hmm. by accident, but for a reason. And there is a plan and a purpose. And we use those words all the time, Mm -hmm. but I really believe that when you believe that, that there really is a plan and a purpose that you do live differently. And I think um, that there is a, a, a lot to what you just said, mm-hmm. but I also um, think um, that one of the greatest calls on, on, on my life and maybe the greatest call on my life is to fight for people that can't fight for themselves. Mm-hmm. That's um, in so many different areas where I felt like God has really wrecked my heart. Mm. Said, "This is what I want you to do." Mm. And it, one of the biggest of those was when I was 15, and I was in the jungles of the Philippines, and mm. I met a boy who was born with his feet on backwards. And because of that, um, his village viewed him as cursed, as less than, as insignificant, and uh, he was a throwaway to his village. Mm. But I knew that day that he wasn't a throwaway to God, mm. and God was putting on my heart that he better not be a throwaway to you. Mm. And so ever since that day, um, I probably haven't done it very well, but I've known that I was supposed to fight for boys and girls, men and women, hurting people all around the world that were viewed as less than. Because to God, nobody is. Nobody is. And I also, I say that because I also think that ties to maybe in my subconscious somewhere that I knew what it was like to also be vulnerable mm-hmm. and weak and malnourished. Cause when I was born, I was malnourished, but I waited for it really quickly. And maybe God placed that in my heart mm-hmm. so that when he did give me athletic ability or strength, it wasn't so that I could carry a football mm-hmm. or hit a baseball. It was so that you can lift him up first and foremost, but then hurting people that the world has put down and you can lift them up. Mm. And that is still um, what I believe is my greatest calling to this day. I wish, I hope people can feel what I'm feeling sitting three feet from you. I just watch your face change. You get really, really emotional when you were telling that story about that young man. And I really believe in life. People respond more to what they feel than even what they hear. Mm. And when I have people in front of me, I always sort of sense their spirit and the Holy Spirit's just all over you. And you're such a beautiful soul, man. And I hope everyone will go back and listen to what you just said again, because this is true for all of you. And I just think so many people feel like throwaways in life right mm-hmm. now. You know, they're, maybe they've had a divorce or people have let them down or hurt them or just maybe their dreams haven't happened yet. And they're yeah. just like, you know, what's my purpose? What's my plan? And I think it's so important to be reminded by somebody as powerful as you that you do matter, that you're not a throwaway, that you do That's have right. a purpose. And that purpose is probably to lift up other people in That's your right. unique way. And you do that so remarkably well. I'm curious, because you could have written a lot of books. 
So his new book, by the way, is called Mission Possible, One Year Devotional, 365 Days of Inspiration for Pursuing Your God-Given Purpose. Go get it. You could have written a lot of different books. Why would you write th- this book this way? Because I, Because of what you just said. Mm-hmm. Because there's so many of us at times that need to know that we have purpose. Mm-hmm. That we have, and mission's just another way of saying that. Yeah, yeah. You know, m- mission just means a task or a job that you have been given to do. And we all have a job here on this earth. And as long as we have breath, we have purpose. And possible just means to be able. Sometimes when we do think we have a purpose or a mission, it's like, well, I know I do, but it's way too vast. It's way too grand. It's impossible. I can't accomplish it. I can't do it. But God has not put us in a place where he's given us a mission we can't accomplish. Yes, maybe on our own, but with him, that mission is possible. We are able to accomplish it. We're able Mm -hmm. to live that out. Mm -hmm. And and really in this devotional, it's it's two to five minutes. Right. Every morning or every evening, mm. just hop in it. And it's really for, for three different goals. One would be to shape because, number one, shape your mindset. Shape mm. your mindset of, man, there's so much that, that gets in our way when we wake up in the morning, when we start the day, that is mm. going to say, hey, you need to do this, 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 and this. You need to remember that life's about this. you you got to remember, focus first on your occupation and get that raise. Mm. And, and I want to change that mindset to when we wake up, let's get in something that is going to reframe our mindset to what's truly the most important thing in that day. It's going to shape our mindset back to the things of life is bigger than us and making an impact and helping people because when we want to be fulfilled, it is not what we're going to take in. It's what we're going to give out. And it's that's just not even close because you know how many conversations I've had and how many people that I've read about and seen that have reached the pinnacle of what they wanted to do in their occupation and how many conversations we've had in the middle of the night where they said, man, I just thought it was going to mean more. Yes. I just thought it was yes. going to mean more. Yes. I thought when I signed that contract, yes. I thought when I got that promotion, I thought when I got to this, then I was going to be fulfilled. Yes. And and so I just want to wow. en- encourage people, all of us, myself included, because I've been in those places where mm. I thought, man, that's what I need. And when I get that, mm. that'll be it. Yeah. And, and even so, you, even you've had absolutely. It. Yeah. And, yeah. And so to, 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 sh- to reshape on what matters and then to be able to challenge, mm. to, to challenge us to get uncomfortable, Yeah. to challenge us in this day when, when. You know, the world is telling us that it needs to be about praise, promotion, platform, Mm. that we remember. Those things aren't necessarily wrong, Mm -hmm. but when they're everything, then they're going to mean nothing. Yeah. And and then the the third goal really was to encourage. Mm. And encouragement just means to give support, confidence, or hope to. Mm. And right now, all of us need support confidence and hope so true we really do yeah we 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 need those things and so man in in the morning if i could just maybe write something that people could say you know what i know it's not perfect i i know maybe i'm not where i want to be but man this is encouraging this helped me Mm -hmm. this reframed a few of my thoughts today this challenged me to say okay you know what today i am going to be willing to get uncomfortable i am going to go talk to that guy i've never talked to i'm going to go talk to that girl i've never Mm -hmm. i am going to give a little bit more than i was willing to give i am going to be a little bit more generous. I am mm. going to be a little bit more courageous. I am mm. going to step out of mm. my comfort zone. Mm. And then all of a sudden, when we start to make those small steps and those small changes, we're like, wow, now I just put myself in a, in a situation where I, I think, you know, gosh, God, you know, impact and influence in, in God can show up in such a way and God can show up in any way he wants because yeah. he's God. But I just don't hear many stories about, you know, us just sitting there watching Netflix and all of a sudden we're right. radically transformed, so you true, know, man. but man, when we step out of our comfort zone, when we all of a sudden, you know, the homeless guy at the light, we stop and we share with him yes. and we give him something, we take him to go get some food. Yeah. And all of a sudden his life isn't just different. Our life is different. Yes. You know, and I see so true, God bro. just showing up in those ways so much more, Amen. you know, and and using it's getting out of our comfort zone being being willing to do some of the things that maybe society is like oh no 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 keep driving keep going mm. oh that's uncomfortable don't do that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but when we get out of our comfort zone mm-hmm. and we show a little courage and we show a little boldness i also think man that's also a place where so much more impact and change and fulfillment comes brother amen like i've done a lot of shows 
there's not that many where like I want to hug someone and run through a wall at the exact same time. No, but you're right. There's this voice. There's a whisper that we have when we do see that homeless person or that friend of ours that we just, well, I should text them. I should call them. And we, we need to listen. That's courage in life. I've had people say, well, you know, someone like you or me, I mean, you're helping people on these. I just do it in small ways. How do you measure big or small? How, yeah. how, how is how is helping another human being feel the presence of God or have confidence or encouragement not a big thing? Yeah. How much bigger of a thing can you possibly do? That's right. And people ask me, they look at you, like, I gave him a hug when he came in. I'm like, well, I probably never felt smaller in my life. And, <laughs> you know, so obviously you're disciplined, you have routines. People ask me about my morning routine, and it's changed over time. You know, sometimes I do a cold plunge. Sometimes I work Love out. cold plunges, Man, by the You're way. cold plunge, too? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I, I do all of that stuff. I've rotated it. But part of my routine that has not wavered or changed is my morning prayer time. And for me, and by the way, my morning prayer is like I do it on my knees because it just reminds me of how small I really am. And, and But that, I, I think I almost do it selfishly from the standpoint that it gives me courage, that connection. It reminds me, everybody, I want you to hear this. No matter what your faith is, Tim and I are both Christians, but just set aside what type of faith you have just for one second, for one second, or that you don't have any faith yet and you're, you're thinking about finding faith, finding Jesus in your life. For me, it's a reminder I'm not alone in everything I do from the minute that I get up, that I'm never alone. And that never aloneness gives me confidence and courage yeah. because I know I don't have the perfect words all the That's time. Right. I don't know what to say. I may not be, pre- I'm not a psychologist. I might, may not be prepared, but I'm never alone when I'm helping other yes. people. And when you feel helpless in your life, get helpful Yes, and it'll change everything just, for you. I, I totally agree. <laughs> I think one of the, the, the biggest ways to get out of a slump, out of a pity party Mm -hmm. is to get out of your comfort zone and help someone else. I have um, an agreement with one of my friends that when something bad would happen to me, Mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to do anything before I served. And um, I would get cut from a team. There would be something disappointing. There would be a whatever that it doesn't matter where I'm at. Mm -hmm. We would meet and we would go serve. No way. Doesn't, no one needs to see, no one needs mm-hmm. to know, but we would just serve mm-hmm. because when you go serve, it changes so much mm-hmm. in such a way that it's almost hard to even put into words. Mm-hmm. But so much of what we do in our lives is about us. Mm-hmm. And when we finally change the focus and the narrative of not putting us first, but actually serving, mm-hmm. There's something that drastically changes. I, I give you one story. I was at the University of Florida in my, mm-hmm. my freshman year. We were fortunate to win a national championship. My sophomore year, I was, um, we were blessed to win the Heisman. I say we because it's, mm-hmm. you know, it took so many people to do it. My junior year, we won a national championship. And my senior year, our goal was to win another national championship, three out of four, something very few teams had ever done. Mm-hmm. And we didn't shy away from that goal. We were confident in it we would literally break it down to best ever you know because we thought we had a chance to to be that we go undefeated 12 and 0 through the regular season get to the sec championship game against alabama one versus two the year before they were one we were two we upset them now this year we were one they were two and they upset us and i'm competitive to yeah. the nth degree but it became more than a game for me and it affected me Hmm. who I was, really? my identity. Um, and I took it way too far. I guarantee you that week, if you were around me, hmm. maybe you wouldn't see me, but if you really knew me, you would know that there was some part of identity hmm. that took place in that game. Interesting. And the next weekend, we're at the Home Depot Awards. It's the college football yeah. awards and everything. And the night before, they have a banquet that we have to go to. And I remember sitting there and, and I'm in such a bad mood. I'm so bitter. I'm so mad. I'm so frustrated. I'm, I regret so much. I'm so upset. It's uh, th- There's just no peace. There's no gentleness. There's no kindness. There's no compassion because it's all about me yeah. and what we lost and what we didn't get. Mm. And they're bringing up uh, some Texas players and Alabama players to the stage because they're going to play in the national championship. And I'm watching that just ready to puke, you know, and, <laughs> right. and, and there's this, um, this waitress that comes up to our table and she looks so nervous 
and um she said just um um uh, you know and I just she's trying to say something and she's so nervous mm-hmm. and she said I'm sorry I'm not supposed to bother you and I said no it's okay well, what is it mm-hmm. and she just takes a you know another 20 seconds to to share it and she finally gets it out there's a girl in her family that I've driven from Virginia to see you and this is in Orlando Florida mm-hmm. that's a long drive mm-hmm. so, and she has um she didn't know how to say it um you know some some things she's fighting and um would you want to see her? Mm. And I'm, of course. So I stand up and I start walking to the back of the room. I guess they're not supposed to let in guests and everything. Mm. And it's kind of a private deal. But yeah. so I think she is nervous. She's going to get in trouble. But I'm so grateful mm. that she had the courage to tell me mm. because uh, it changed my life. They, they, um, they open the doors and then comes walking this young girl named Kelly Fawnen who has had brain tumors and tremors. And she's overcome more in her life than mm. I would could ever possibly overcome. She is such um, an inspiration to me and so many people. Mm. And Kelly, it's really hard for her to to walk and take the next step. But she is so excited to see me. Mm. And she is trying to take the next step and get closer to me as I'm walking towards her. She's walking towards me and she almost falls on every step, mm. you know, because her weight her. gets too far forward. Mm-hmm. And she's trying to, and finally she gets to me and her arms are open wide and she just wraps me up and gives me this amazing hug mm. and squeezes me. And no one said anything yet. And I'm just mm. hugging her and squeezing her for probably a minute or so. And then without saying anything, she starts crying. Mm. And then I start crying and her parents were right there and my parents were right here and all of them are crying. Mm. And, and, and then, um, I step back and, and we start talking, I get to meet Kelly and I get to hear about her story and I get to hear about what she's gone through and what she's been through and the, the, the courageous young woman that she is. And, um, I just felt it on my spirit to ask her to be my date the next night for the red carpet and the award ceremony. Oh, and, uh, and thankfully she said yes. Oh, wow. And so the, the next morning, my, my uncle took her out to, with her parents and her sister to, to get her a, a dress for, so she could be the belle of the ball. And, and then, uh, all of us went to dinner that, that next night before the red carpet and the award ceremony. And I mean, oh. Edward, dying we're laughing we're having oh. the most fun at dinner we're enjoying the whole thing it was amazing and then we go in to the red carpet and we're, we're walking down the red carpet and the crowd's going crazy for her and they're mm-hmm. cheering for her and all of this yeah. and and she just looks so happy so joyful so beautiful as we walk down the red carpet and then we go into our seats and and i guess sitting literally like row one seat a and Mm -hmm. she's like right beside me and and her family's near us and my family's right behind me and and i i I was up for for quite a few awards that year and uh maybe maybe six something like that i can't remember exactly but something like that and and and, man i'll tell you what the night was amazing gosh it was so awesome and then the award show starts and the first award that I'm up for and I lose and I'm like, ah, oh, it's okay. You know, it's not about that. It's about Kelly. The second award starts and I lose. Oh, it's, it's okay. It's about Kelly. Third award and I lose. All right. It stings a little bit, you know, getting a little irritated. Fourth award, lose. Fifth award, lose. And now all of those emotions and selfishness and bitterness and everything that was about me is coming back. And it's flooding me. Mm-hmm. And then as they're getting ready to announce the sixth award, and as I'm sitting here, I can't even tell you what it's for. Right. But at the moment, you would have thought, this is everything. It's huge. And before they announce it, my mom sitting behind me leans forward, and she whispers in my ear, Timmy, you already won tonight. You just don't get your award till heaven. Oh. What is she talking about? She's not talking about this college football award. Mm. She's talking about what mattered in the moment. Yeah. What mattered in the moment was Kelly and her family. And you see, what what was happening was when I was at the, the banquet the night before, mm. in that whole week, everything was about me. Mm. It was about me. Mm. It was about me. It was mm. about me. And then I met Kelly and it changed because I was inspired by her. And so I stopped focusing on myself for one minute and I started thinking about her. And you know what happened? Mm. I finally refound joy yeah. and peace yeah. and, and, and 
uh, happiness, but happiness isn't the right word. Joy is more of the yeah, right word. Yeah. And and that was there until it started to become about me again. Mm-hmm. We're right back. Went right back into it mm-hmm. until I was reminded, until I was reminded. And that's, you know, one of the things I think is so important is we have to remind ourselves yeah. over and over and over again what matters. Yeah. You know, what are the things that we believe? What do we hold fast to? What are our convictions? What are our non-negotiables? Yeah. We have to remember and we have to meditate on those things yeah. to remind us. Because if not, other things are going to fill our brain, fill our heart, and yeah. they're going to start to creep in. Not yeah. all together, but the creep in. Oh, no, no, no. You need to put yourself first. Oh, no, no, no. You shouldn't be happy if you don't win. Yeah. No, it's about you. Yep. It is, no, it is about you. And all these things are going to creep in over because that's what we, that's what society tells it's us. It's so true, man. It's about you. And if yeah. it's, and, and, and if it, it's not about you, then you need to be like this other person's because you need to be more like them. Mm-hmm. They have more followers and you need to be like their highlight reel mm-hmm. on their Instagram, on their social media. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just constantly saying either you need to be more, it needs to be about you or you need to be more, more like, like them. Them. And yes. and I'm just so grateful for Kelly that day. And, and by the way, we're still close friends and she has raised hundreds of thousands oh. for the foundation. And she's a mama bear to so many other kids and oh. she makes such an impact and she is, she's so incredible. But I'm just so grateful that she reminded me on that day what really matters. And, and going back to what I was just saying about wow. remembering is I think there's a reason why in Deuteronomy, Moses remind, 22 times says to the Israelites, mm-hmm. remember or do not forget. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you have, could imagine if God had, had rescued you and, and parted the sea and you're like, you would never have to say, Timmy, remember right. what happened. Right. But instantly, yep. they started focusing on a lot of other things and forgot the goodness of God. Gosh, man. And so we need, Moses reminded them, we need to be reminded over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And we need to go back and we need to remember what matters, our non-negotiables, our convictions, all the amazing things that God has done in our life. And we need to focus on those things. And so, mm-hmm. you know, when when we get out of bed and we focus on those things, then we, we reframe our mind. We go back to what matters. True. We go back to what's important. We're encouraged by good things. And now we go get ready to head out to life. Brother, that is one of the great stories like it it kind of reads like a movie script let's be real right like even the people in the studio over there are like nodding like that is one of the great it's not easy to give me goosebumps like it is just isn't right i got like goosies everywhere because it's exactly true you know i think what a lot of people think by the way and i've thought this when i ever say a lot of people when you're listening to the show i mean like i also am a lot of people right (laughs) but i used to think when things weren't good in my life what you just said sounds really good. And once I get my own life together, I'm going to really start serving other people. Yeah. When I can get my head above water, when I stop drowning, yeah. then I'll do it. And what I have found in my life is that you're going to take you with you when you get to these next destinations. And if you can't find a way to find joy and bliss and what you talk about in the book, a great deal, gratitude yeah. in the moments of your life where it's difficult. In other words, if your bliss, if your service, if your love, if your faith is conditional on everything being dialed in in your life right now, you're going to have very few moments of bliss and joy in your life. And it's actually not real. And so the hard thing to do in life when I was the most broke and my water was turned off and friends were abandoning me was to find things to be grateful for in those moments, which is why I love your book, because it's just a reminder on a daily basis to find the small things in life that we're grateful for. And everyone in personal development talks about, you got to be gratitude. You got to have gratitude. But I think listening to you and being with you, this is a real pattern and benchmark of your life, right? Gratitude. Absolutely. But but see, what happens with gratitude is a lot of people think that, oh, um, gratitude is an emotion or a feeling that I get. And sometimes it can be, but it can also be a choice of when I choose to focus on the things that I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. And the University of Miami did a study, and I won't remember necessarily every part of the study, but a main part of the study was in one of the control groups that they had to write down every one thing every day that they were grateful for, and I think for 10 weeks. And then they had some of the other control groups write down other things. But the point of it was that that group that for 10 weeks wrote down one thing every day, and mm. you think, well, that's so easy. Yeah. Well, I can write down one thing every day for 10. That's not mm. a lot. Mm. At the end of the study, that group 
had a biological chemical mm. reaction for the better mm. literally their health mm. improved mm. their mindset improved mm. they were better off because mm. for 10 weeks they wrote down one thing yep they were grateful for yep right there's something to choosing mm-hmm. gratefulness it's so true not not just feeling grateful Very good, choosing man. it because sometimes we don't feel like it mm-hmm. but i'm so grateful we don't have to live always by our feelings because mm. feelings are really fickle mm-hmm. And they come and go, man, do you know how many days, you know, when you, the alarm goes off at five, you're like, I don't want to wake up. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go do this. Mm-hmm. But we don't have to live by our emotions. Gosh, we get to choose our convictions mm-hmm. of what we believe, of what we want to live for, of what we want to stand for. And that doesn't mean we're perfect with it. We screw up all the time with it. Mm-hmm. But if you live by your emotions, then your life will be a roller coaster. Gosh, that's so true. Yeah. It will be a roller coaster. You're going to have some awesome days. Man, I feel like it. I feel mm. grateful. Mm. But then you're going to have other days where you don't feel like it. Yep. yep. And in those <sighs> moments, what do we go back to? Mm. Can we still write down what we're grateful for? So good, dude. Can we reframe our mindset? Yeah. Can we find encouragement? Yeah. Can, can we remember all of those things? Yeah. And uh, Tim. <laughs> Just, Are you listening to you? I don't think sometimes I do the show, it becomes out of body for me every once in a while. I'm like, I'm so proud of this guy right now. <laughs> and I don't, and it's not about you. It's just like I don't I do this show because I love humans and I want joy and the love and and the techniques and the strategies and all that in life too. But no one has ever sat there, ever, or all the shows I used to film in my house and said that gratitude is not just an emotion. It's actually a conscious choice. Yes. It's also part of the, you know, my book, I read about the matrix of our life, like the filter that we see life through. And that story you're telling yourself alters this filter. And if that filter is to find the things that worry you, that give you anxiety, that give you fear, that give you depression, that give you anger, you will find them on a daily basis because yes. they're there. Yes. But if your filter is to choose to find gratitude daily, to see that you will then begin to see those things that have always been there before. Isn't that really about perspective, what you're saying? One million percent. It's, I, I, I can give you an example, too. You're going you're gonna to love this. My mother-in-law, Patricia, is the most godly woman ever. She sees the Lord everywhere <laughs> you know you know like your mm-hmm. mom might be like, like mm-hmm. no matter what she sees the lord and i used oh, yeah. to when i was young i've known her since i was 14 i used to kind of laugh about it like gosh geez, she's so pollyanna like my gosh like she doesn't work in the real world like if she was in the real world she'd know there's stuff and things and stress and worry <laughs> and the older i've gotten like we'll walk outside literally timmy like outside tim and she'll go the wind will blow in her face thank you jesus and she'll just feel she she's constantly her her matrix her filter is to find it's not even just gratitude to be honest with you my my mother-in-law is looking for the lord everywhere yeah and she sees it everywhere and you know what she hasn't aged yeah I'm, my mother-in-law is almost 80 years old she looks 40 and i think one of the things you just said is her biochemistry's changed her her health is better she's just a remarkable person based on her perspective and now i want to go to perspective because one of the great moments of all sports for me ever let me tell you when it was okay because i also think in life it's not just it's not just the story we tell ourselves but it's how we respond when adversity comes our way mm-hmm. so my favorite was back in 2008 and there's this football team that loses 31 to 30 i think it was was it old miss yes. or who was it It was old yeah, miss. miss so he knows your face just changed again right and this young man who has no business being this wise or this strong or this humble or this courageous at a young man i mean people forget when you're watching these college athletes because they they run and look like grown men these are still very young people and i knew who you were but I, yeah he's another player he talks about god that's great then i watched i watched this press conference i saw it live let me tell you what happens this young man will probably play it on the youtube or the audio here on the audio but this young man gets up and says and he's down you look at his face in this video he's down he says to the fans and everybody in gator nation i'm I'm sorry sorry. i'm extremely sorry you know we were hoping for an undefeated season that was my goal something the floor has never done here but i promise you one thing a lot of good will come out of this you have never seen any player in the entire country play as hard as i will play the rest of the season and you never see someone push the rest of the team as hard as i will push everybody the rest of the season you never see a team play harder and we will the, the rest, rest of the season. season. God, God bless. bless. And he walks out. I'm thinking, how how does he respond like this when this happens? And if you know the rest of the story, they did exactly that. Don't you think part of life 
is how you respond in the times when adversity hits like that. Absolutely. And has that been a benchmark for you like throughout your life and the advice you'd give to people who are facing adversity and challenges right now? Well, I would first say that adversity is here. It just left or it's on its way. <laughs> life, uh, I just don't think we should ever give people the false notions that adversity is not a part of life. Mm. It is. It's a part of life. I think it's important because we're talking about gratitude and all this stuff. Right. Like, but this you other can thing. still be grateful even in the midst of it, not when it's perfect because it's never going to be perfect. Mm. We can be grateful even in the hard times. And mm. and I think for me in that, mo in that moment, I felt such a weight, a burden, and a responsibility um, because I missed the mark. Mm. I did. Um, as a leader, as the quarterback, as a part of Gator Nation, I bleed orange and blue. So it wasn't just as a player. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was my grandfather's dream for him to see Florida win an SEC championship. I mean, he died before that happened. I didn't know that. Yeah, he, it was part of life. And so I had dreamed about this since I was a boy, and Florida's never had an undefeated season. So uh, when – and for about an hour, I was waiting for the press conference, and I was sitting there, and Coach Meyer was sitting beside me, and every, I keep getting emotional, keep getting emotional because it just – it meant that much to me. Mm -hmm. And then as I go to do the press conference, my, my parents are walking down in, so I get emotional again, and I have mm -hmm. cool down again. And so then I go in and I answer all the questions. And then I want to, um, I wanted to say something. I wanted to say something. I didn't have to, I didn't need to, mm -hmm. but I, w I felt like I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference. And the first thing that I wanted to say, because I believe when you do something wrong, the first thing you should do is apologize mm -hmm. and not just up say, oh, I apologize. That's not an apology. Mm -hmm. Apologize is to say, I am sorry. And so I wanted to apologize first and foremost, Amazing. and I, I did it twice mm -hmm. to say, I'm sorry, because when you feel like you did something wrong, mm -hmm. you need to apologize. And that's the first thing I wanted to do. And, and so I apologized twice, but then I just believe and, 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 you know, I'm just so grateful for my parents and trying to instill this is to apologize and then say how it's going to be different. Yeah. Right. Because it's, it, it's, it's not just, um, a disappointment or a wrong, but it's a learning moment. It's a learning curve. It could be one of the greatest moments of your life if you take it down and you learn from it mm -hmm. and you adjust and you adapt and you grow so that that moment might be the reason you don't have to face those moments for a long time because you changed, you learned, you grew, you adapt. And sometimes that sucky moment could be one of the greatest moments you ever have in your life because I learned so much from it. Or I could sit in it. And so I just Jesus. I wanted to... to um, apologize. And then I wanted to say, and it's, it was funny as people will, will sometimes quote and they'll be like, Oh, you promised y'all we're going to win the national championship. I'm like, I never said that. that. I can't make a promise right. that I don't know if it'll come true. And mm -hmm. so I promised something I believed I could control mm -hmm. was that I was going to be the hardest working player. Cause I believe I could control that, mm -hmm. that everything, yeah. everything I could do mm -hmm. and that our team, because I believed how our team would respond. Let me ask you about that. I wanted to ask you this. You're, um, in unbelievable shape you've got what appears to me to be a beautiful new marriage in your life you help all kinds of people in so many different ways you I what I the things I love about you is you're a masculine man who's so masculine that he can be gentle and kind I think that's real masculinity you don't have to flex it and you you're 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 a unique man and somebody that I admire a great deal and I'm curious for you and I, I, I really, really want to know this. Hard work. People use that term. You talk about it in the devotional too. Hard work. I don't, what does that look like, Tim? Like when you're talking about, I'm going to work, like you said, there's a young man, but then you did it when you got to the NFL and you've done it when you went to play baseball. And then you did it when you're now in broadcasting. I guarantee you, you prepare like nobody prepares. What does the top of the top work look like? In other words, you know what I mean? People go, I'm a hard worker in the gym. I work yeah. hard. Is your hard work compared against the best possible version of you? Do you measure it against other teammates? Is it to the point of in, failure? What in, is hard in work? In sports, you would definitely measure it up against other people because that can sometimes drive you. One of the things that I, I find fascinating is when you grow up, so many people, coaches, teachers, all sorts of people, um, they will say, hey, it's so important to be a hard worker, to work hard. And I was 
I always I kind of sit back and and want to say, why, mm. why is that important? Mm. Well, why why is it important to be a hard worker? Yeah, it's it, and I think when you tell kids to work hard, and there's no why behind it, mm. it seems half baked. You're like, right. And so I don't like to tell kids to work hard. Okay. As a matter of fact, I very rarely tell them to work hard, but I say when you do find that thing in your life that you care so much about, mm-hmm. you will be willing to work hard. Mm-hmm. And so where are you going to find that thing in your life mm. that you are, because mm. I, I don't think that I was a, I don't, I wouldn't say that I was necessarily a hard worker. I would say that, um, for so much of my life in sports, I loved it so much. I was so passionate mm-hmm. that I would be willing to sacrifice. It didn't come from a place of hard work. It came from a place of caring, yeah. caring about the game, mm-hmm. loving my teammates, mm-hmm. loving the coaches, not wanting to let people down. Mm-hmm. And so that was something that, that would drive me to go to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. And I have um, two quotes on my, on my wall when I was young and growing up. Is one of them was, somewhere he is out there training while I am not, and when we meet, he will win. And so it wasn't the thought of, I want to go work hard. It was a thought of, I want to be my best. And I know somewhere he's waking up in the middle of the night and he's training. So you know what? I better wake up in the middle of the night too. And actually, I first saw that when I was a young boy and Mike Krzyzewski came on TV and then it showed kids all around the world shooting free throws. And I couldn't get it all down. And so my mom was like, okay, you need to go to sleep. And I said, no, mom, I got, can I please see this commercial one more time? Mm. And she sat up with me, waited till the commercial played again, and I couldn't get it all down. Mm-hmm. And she got the whole thing down, mm-hmm. and we put it on the wall. And and so I'd get up and I'd look at that. Somewhere he is out there mm-hmm. training while I am not. He's training for my scholarship. He's training for the championship. He's training for the trophy. He's training for the moment. He's training for all of that mm-hmm. while I am not. Mm-hmm. And when we meet because of those choices, he will win. I didn't, I, I couldn't, I can't get up in the middle of the night because I want to have a work ethic, but I can get up in the middle of the night because I have a conviction that I want to be my best because I have one life. I have mm-hmm. one opportunity. I have one chance mm-hmm. that can get me up at night. Mm-hmm. Not because man, I want to be so disciplined to be a hard worker. Mm-hmm. That's just, it's so, Very good. It does, it's, there's no weight behind it. Yeah. But if you think in your life, you have one chance to be your best and every single one of us has that same chance. Mm. Not all of us. We don't have a chance to be the best. Mm. Very few people have the chance to be the best in something, Mm. but every one of us has the chance to be our best in it. And so are we going to wake up and say, hey, with this day, with this moment, with this year, Mm. with my life, with Mm. this chance, Mm. because I believe that I'm here for a reason, that I have purpose, that I can make a difference, that I love what I'm doing, that I'm passionate, which passion ultimately also just means, passion is a 12th century Latin word that means to suffer. And where the word even comes from is from the passion of the Christ, that Jesus cared so much for humanity that he's willing to go to the cross to suffer for them. So when we say we're passionate about something, it's not excitement, motivation, or hype. Mm -hmm. It means that we care so much about something, we're willing to suffer for it. So when we say, hey, we love something, we're passionate, know what we're talking about. Oh, my God. That means we're going to sacrifice. And so I think that you don't want to just tell somebody, hey, have a work ethic, buddy. (laughs) Right? Yeah. It's no, man. Mm -hmm. Do you love it? Mm. Are you passionate about it? Mm. Right? Do you want to make the most of your life, of your time? We don't know how much time we're going to have, but man, when we have it, let's run after the things we love and we're called to. Let's run after the dreams and the goals that we feel like God has placed in our heart and our life. Right? That will convict you and wake you up and get you out of bed so Mm. that I can say, no, he's not going to be able to say that to me. How the heck are you doing this? You're like exceeding what I thought you would possibly do today. There's The Highway Patrol loves you and I because there are so many damn speeding tickets happening right now because they're listening to the show going, they're at 85 <laughs> miles an hour. People are like level 26 on the treadmill right now. I'm ready to run through the daggum wall, <laughs> and I'm dead serious right now. But when someone's speaking also, I'm like, I put it through my truth barometer. And you're really right. Like, be a hard worker. Dun, dun, dun. This is something that has to come from love. I'm really I'm writing about this right now too, brother. So it's like profound for me that you're talking about it. But all great things are created from love. All great creation, all great genius, all the way back to the crucifixion mm-hmm. and the suffering that took place there comes from love. The ultimate saving 
comes from love. So all great creation comes from these places. And that's why the gratitude piece matters because when you're grateful, yes. you're finding the things you love, the things you can love, and you can begin to create from there. There's another thing about you that goes unnoticed because it's just who you are, which I want to, I want to acknowledge you and I want you to speak to this. You have a lot of courage and you're so humble. Like when you're describing the story of meeting the young woman, I get to meet her. I get to go to dinner with her. I don't know that I was that hard of a worker. Okay. Well, everyone you freaking played with said you were. So other people seem to think you were a really hard worker. All your coaches seem to think you were a crazy hard worker. You just have a great deal of humility. And that nuance, by the way, my favorite humans have a tremendous amount of confidence combined with a high degree of humility. That's a really unique nuance. It's my, what I try to look for even in my friends, even in great leaders. Show me someone with a lot of confidence, no humility, we know what's going to happen to them. Show me with somebody with a lot of humility, but it doesn't develop any confidence. You're constantly having to carry them through life, right? So that common thing. But then there's another element, which is courage, which is to speak our convictions which is to speak up when we believe something, even in the face of adversity. And one thing about you, and I want everyone to understand this, even if they didn't, don't know this about you, you've taken a lot of criticism in your life, bro. A lot. You took a lot of criticism for standing up for your faith. Tons of it. You were made fun of. You were mocked. People would put out memes and pictures about you. Then you get to the NFL. Ah, he can't throw. He can't play. The truth is the NFL is finally caught up to you. A lot of the quarterbacks in the NFL now play your style of football. I almost wish you got drafted now because mobile quarterbacks who can throw on the run, who can move the football, who are real leaders, seem to be dominating the NFL right now. You were just about a decade too early, right? And I don't even know that that's true if someone had just given you a chance to keep playing because this dude not only was a first-round pick, he's won a playoff game, and this is a guy who a lot of teams now would really wish they had playing quarterback for them. But the point is, you've taken a lot of criticism. Then you have the courage. Now, nah, I'm going to go play baseball. Oh, Tim Tebow's a baseball player now, right? <laughs> you could have really fallen on your face. No, he actually worked himself into a position where this dude became an actual prospect to go play in the big leagues. But you've been willing to take criticism for your convictions, your beliefs, and your dreams. Most people aren't. So I want you to speak to that about why you were willing to do it and how important it is in life. Well, um, uh, thank you for that. I th there's a, a lot to that. And I think I would start by going back to perspective mm. of um, what we were talking about a minute ago. And uh, I'll, I'll use the, the word boldness. Mm. And the definition of that coming from the Greek would be to put it all on the line to do what is necessary. And I, I, I've even along the way won some awards for being bold. And I would say that when people say, oh, you are bold for your faith or courageous. Or, and I would say, no, I wasn't. Maybe, maybe compared to a few, but to compare to my heroes, okay. no. Um, one of the reasons like my dad is, um, such a massive hero of mine is because he did it in places where they said, if, if you tell people about the love of your God, we'll kill you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he still did. Mm -hmm. And for heroes of mine that are all over the world helping people and their life is on the line, mm -hmm. that's, that's the definition. You put it all on the line to do what is necessary. I've never had to do that. Mm -hmm. I've never had to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there's criticism, and, but when you regain that perspective, mm -hmm. what lens you're seeing out of, no, I mean, my, my life wasn't on the line. I, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe to some people because it was public that, well, it's a big deal, but ultimately, and yeah, sometimes it felt like to me it would be, it'll it sometimes affect you and you're like, man. And I, I even remember when I was a, a freshman in college and it, getting a little bit of more of that. And I remember going to my dad and be like, dad, man, if so many people would just get to know me, dad, they would like me. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know what, Timmy, they would because you're likable. Mm -hmm. But there's some people that don't want to even get to know you to like you. Mm -hmm. And I was also at the same time I was reading a book mm -hmm. um, about Winston Churchill that in a time in his life, the majority of the world didn't like him. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And the Allies thought he's going to lose the war for his decisions. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you weren't on the Allies, then you were his enemy. Mm-hmm. And so the majority of the world couldn't stand him. Mm-hmm. And he writes, if you have enemies, good. It means you stood for something at least once in your life. Oh, bro, so and I was just like, so how put I, I didn't understand it. I was like, how, how could it be good? Yeah. How could it be good to have enemies? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and I want to make people like me. And I, I just, um, my, um, my personality at its core is to, I want people to like me. I want to be friends. I'm, okay. um, okay. uh, and then I, I would kind of went through this, this, you know, process of trying to study. And I think, you know, um, God kind of impacting my heart where I was like, man, although I, I really want people to like me, I kind of adjusted to, well, like is so superficial and mm-hmm. fickle. Mm-hmm. Um, you post something that they, that they enjoy, they like it you post something I might not understand or they might not agree with and they instantly dislike you. Mm-hmm. So I kind of changed my framework to instead of liking, and I would have to choose to do this. I didn't feel like doing this, but choose to do this to go from liking to respecting. Mm-hmm. What if on all social media, it wasn't about likes, it was about respect. respect. Great point. Now, right, who yeah. clicks it? Yeah, that's really and good. so it was like, okay, really respect good. is a lot longer mm-hmm. to earn, mm-hmm. but it's going to last a lot longer okay. as well. Mm-hmm. And so that was part of the framework. And then oh, it was boy, also, um, you know, uh, a verse that really impacted me was John 16, 33, and it's Jesus in the upper room talking to mm-hmm. disciples. And he looks at them a time when they totally don't get it, a lot like me mm-hmm. in my life. I just don't get it all. <laughs> and, and he looks at them and says, for in me, you have peace. In the world, you're going to have trials and tribulations, mm-hmm. but take heart mm-hmm. i have overcome the world That's so good bro. and so it, it was in this this framework of like we're going to have trials and tribulations and and we're going to look all over for peace but it only comes in one person and it's the prince of peace and and we have a job to do and that's to take heart mm-hmm. another way to say that is to choose courage choose courage and <laughs> it it's so fascinating that when you look at at scripture Everywhere that word is used, take heart. Tharseo is the word. Mm-hmm. And in Jesus' public ministry, it's used four times. Mm-hmm. And every time it's hurting, confused people, he says, take heart. And then he performs a miracle. Mm-hmm. And in this one, it's when he goes to Calvary's cross. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, we're just reminded that life's not going to be easy. There's going to be trials and tribulations, but we want to have peace that's found in a person, and we have to take heart. Why? Because we remember, rem- going back to remember, that he's overcome the world. And ultimately, he's putting in perspective that, wait a second, this isn't that big a deal. It might feel like a big deal. It might feel because this when you pick this up, that's yeah. what people are saying. But ultimately, it's not a big deal because so many heroes are around the world that are under real persecution. Their life is on the line. And so going back to boldness, putting it all on line to do what is necessary, they're doing it. I've never had to do it and if and if it came to it would i be willing to i don't know mm-hmm. that's the truth is the reality as i don't know but there are heroes of the faith that are doing it all over that's what courage and that's what boldness looks like and i've never had to do that and so i need to put in perspective of of uh, i i don't know if i could or if i would i, I hope if it came to that yeah. i i would but man i i need to understand what it's about and put it into to perspective and wow Tim. um mm-hmm. <laughs> you know by the way everybody i just want to say one thing he didn't know I was going to ask him any of this stuff. So when you're listening to this, like it's the answers are this rolling off the tongue. This is obviously the Holy Spirit all over this man. But having said that to you all, like he didn't know I was going to ask him any of these things. And I have to say, one thing that you did open up by saying was the people that are your heroes, though, show that boldness because they've got respect. And standing to speak your convictions in moments that are difficult or even being in a, organ, a group of people where someone's gossiping and say, hey, I don't I don't want to participate in this. That's being bold. That's standing for your convictions, standing for your faith, believing in your company or your product, believing in whatever it might be, getting up and saying as a, a young, young, young man that you're never going to see a team work this hard. These are standing up and being willing. So maybe you haven't done the things like your father. I agree with you. But I respect people in big way. I respect people. I watched something in a restaurant the other day where I had, I didn't know it was happening, but uh, uh, the table's being rude to this server. 
And then I, I didn't hear it. And the manager of the place came by. And usually what would a manager do? Oh, I'm so sorry. She made a mistake. The manager said, hey, I don't want you speaking to the people that work in here that way. She's trying her best. She's new here. She's a good young woman. I believe in her. And then she brought he brought the server back over to the table and said, I just want you to know you're doing a great job. I love you. I believe wow. in you. I know you're trying your best. I thought, I no, to your point, Absolutely. I respect that That's man right. for standing up in that moment to help the helpless, mm-hmm. to help those that were thrown away, yeah. felt thrown away, which is what they were doing to that person over there. So thank you for that. I got two more questions because we're going to run out of time. The, I don't know that I've ever done an interview. I'm not, I'm being serious too. That's flown by this quickly. I agree. I was I, like, what? Where'd I know. You see? Seriously, started. brother. Like, that's how you know. Like, I'm like, well, I, I, I would love to go so much longer, but I do have a couple more things. One of the things you've dealt with, and a lot of people are dealing with this, you've dealt with, and I'm talking about in the world. But in this world, the physical world, you've dealt with dreams ending. Yeah. There were dreams of yours. So you had an NFL dream, and it ended. Probably you would have liked it to gone a little Before bit Before you wanted it to. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then you had a baseball dream. Yeah. And it didn't quite go to the extent that you wanted it to. And I'm sure you've even had relationships that didn't work the way that you wanted to. And there's just a lot of people like, you know, my first dream. I had this beautiful relationship and they cheated and we're no longer married or I had this business I started it or didn't happen or you know I wanted to get in this particular amount of shape and it hasn't happened in my dream my first dream my second dream my third dream hasn't happened what advice would you give to somebody who's had a dream end like that yeah really really good question really hard question to answer too but I would mm-hmm. go maybe in a couple of ways the first way I would say is when we're going through life I think it's really important how we make decisions. And sometimes we make decisions because that's what we like or that's what we want or that's how we feel. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I try to make decisions is what am I going to regret the least one day? Hmm. And what am I going to regret the least? Hmm. I don't want to live a life of regret. I would would rather think through it in a way where I could try to say, hey, you know what? I might go after this. Baseball is one example. <laughs> I remember sitting in, in New York City with all uh, agents around, and they're telling me all these different opportunities, and a lot of them would bring up the finances and all of this. And and baseball was just on my heart. It was something I loved since I was a young boy. And at the end of them presenting all these options and things that I could go do, I said, hey, guys, what, what would you all think if I went and played baseball? <laughs> And they're like, you could hear a pin drop. Like, what are you talking about? But And then they don't say, do you love it? Are you passionate? Do you care about it? It was, well, what if you fail? And ultimately, then I would just be making a decision based on mm. approval, mm. based on what other people think. And they would be saying, but the finances. And so then you won't make a lot of money. You won't make any money. You probably lose money, actually. So then I'm going to choose in my life to make decisions on what other people think Mm. and finances. Mm. And I just don't think that's a reason we should make, yes, I get, sometimes we got to make choices to take care of our family. Mm. That's, that's different, but Mm. this is an area where you're going after um, something you, you, you love as a, as a reason why you do it or other things that you're going after. And I just don't think that it's a, it's, it's, I think if we let other people define what we choose in our life, that it's going to be very hard to find fulfillment and joy and true passion in that because we're not going after what we were called to, what we love, what we're passionate about. We're doing what other people think we should do with our lives. Yep. And I didn't want uh, to let my agents do that or let their Mm -hmm. opinion of what the world's going to think or even the media. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I made that decision, I did get a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my responses is, so you want me to go after things because you like it or you're passionate or you Mm want to do it. I want to do what what, what Mm -hmm. I feel like I love and I'm passionate about it. And Mm -hmm. I got to go live that out and do that and pursue Mm -hmm. that and enjoy that moment. And I feel Mm -hmm. like if I didn't, then I would have lived with a lot more regret Mm -hmm. than actually going to do that. So. Good. And I just think that maybe if that could encourage that someone, does. don't let other people yeah. make choices for you. Yeah, and also, what would you regret the least? Yeah, you know, to go play baseball and it maybe didn't go as far as you wanted it to. All right, maybe there's a little bit of regret with that. But what? How much more regret would you have had in your 60s? If I said no, yeah, I'll and, never try. And, and I never know. I and, never know. And if how I could many have... times, especially talking to kids now? Well, oh my gosh, what are people going to say? Or oh my gosh, what if I don't make it? Or oh my gosh, what if I fail? Mm. It's a possibility. Mm. You ever going to run for office? Oh, I, I don't know. Um, Anybody ever ask you that? 
You yes. must be nice to that. Yeah. Um, and I've always responded by saying if I felt like that's where I could make the greatest impact, I would think about it. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely not where I feel called now. I feel like yeah. the greatest impact is, is with our foundation and the impact mm-hmm. we're trying to make around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll never say no to, if I feel like that's what I'm called to. I'm just sitting there watching. I wish we had more leaders like you in those spaces. That's the only reason I said it. I'm not suggesting you should or shouldn't do it. Um, all right, I got a last question for you. I want to say first, thank you for today. Exceeded my expectations. And I had really big expectations. For thank today you. Because I love people and I want this time. I only do one a week, man. I do 52 of these a year. It really matters a lot to me that it makes an impact in people's lives. And I'm honored to sit in an hour like this where uh, it makes me emotional. So I won't go any further, but I just know human beings' lives are being impacted around the world right now. And so I'm grateful for you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, last thing, when you talk about whatever you want here at the end, but you do talk about the importance of being intentional, especially in terms of faith yeah. and living an intentional life. Um, I wonder what that means to you, what advice you would give people about living in a more intentional Oof, existence. That's a, that's a really um, deep mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. I think so many times in life, we let society and Mondays get in the way. Mm-hmm. Monday gets here and we're just right back at this race, keeping up with the Joneses and letting everybody say what we're supposed to do and what we have to do. And I got to do all, all of these things. And it's like, well, if your convictions say that you need to go help people, have you ever taken a mission trip? Yes. Yeah. If your convictions say that you, that, that you need to do X, Y, and Z, have you done those things? Or mm-hmm. have we constantly let things get in the way? And it's like, oh, one day. Yeah. And I just feel like there has been so many times in my life, I, I've been way too much of a one dayer. One day I'm going to do that. One day I'm going to get to that. One day, and mm-hmm. it's like, I don't know how many days I'm going to have. So while I do have a day, I want to get, to get after it because this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And for the, the, the callings and the responsibility of my life, I have to go after and pursue them. Or I'm saying, really, that's not as important on this day as what I'm doing. Mm. And gosh. and I, I just I don't want at the end of my life to be someone to look back and say, man, there were a lot of days where I just said, hey, one day I'll do that, but I never did it. And then ultimately I'm looking back at regret because I just let life get in the way. Mm. Uh, and I said they're my convictions, but they didn't impact me enough to live by them. And so th- that would be maybe how it answer oh. trying to be intentional. Um, you say you love people, but the greatest form of love is a choice. See, the Greeks had four different types of love, but the most admirable form of love was agape. And the best definition I've ever heard of agape is to choose people's best interests and act on their behalf. So when you love people, you say you love people, did we actually choose their best interests and act on their behalf? And so I would say I want to be intentional wow. about that, mm. intentional about choosing people's best interest for the abuse, for the neglected, for the traffic, for the thrown away, for mm. the areas I feel called. I want to be intentional about choosing their best interest because I love them. And I don't want that to just be a saying that comes out of my mouth. I want it to be my heart posture. I want it to be my hands and my feet. I want it to be my life where at the end of my life, I don't look back and say, I said I loved them, but I was actually just a one day or that one day was going to get to it. And so really I said it, but I didn't believe it. And, and there's been so many times in my, my life where I know I've, uh, uh, I, I've just missed the mark and I've let life get in the way and I've let pursuit of things and, and so many other things get in the way. And I don't want to let those things get in the way. I know I'll continue to fall short and mess up. Um, but, and so that's, you know, s- such a reason I'm so grateful for the grace of God that he picks us back up and he, yeah, yeah. he, um, you know, it doesn't judge us by, uh, you know, our scars, but by Jesus' scars. Mm-hmm. You know, when we know him and what he did by us mm-hmm. is, you know, that mm-hmm. he sees us through his scars. And so yeah. we are made right with him because of the blood of the cross. And so, you know, but, but I, because I'm so grateful for that and thankful and want to live with humility of, of, 
I have fallen short and messed up, but by the grace of God, I can get up and I can go show the world and help people with the days and the time that I have. So I don't end my days looking back saying, oh, what if, why didn't I? Because I didn't actually love you because I didn't actually really love people. And, you know, I I don't want to finish my life saying that. I want to finish my life saying, you know what? I, I know I messed up so many times, but man, with the race that was set before me, I ran. And one day when I get to heaven, I don't want to get to heaven well rested. I want to get to heaven exhausted because millions of people around the world are starving, abused, beaten, neglected, thrown away. And for all of them, I want to get to them because I know that's a calling on my life. And if I don't accept that and run after it, then I'm either saying, God, I really didn't believe it or I really didn't love them. And so that's how I I would just say that I want to be intentional. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's, bro. Bro. And too many times I haven't been enough. Me too. But you inspire me to want to be more. Um, yeah, not a lot of times I've not had something to say when we're done. I mean it. Uh, there's a lot of goosebumps all over my body. There's some people in life that are motivational, and I appreciate that. There's other people that are so inspirational. and They speak in spirit. You definitely have a lot of that. You're motivational. You're inspirational. Rarely do I sit in the presence of people who are also aspirational people. And there, I see things in you um, that I aspire to be more like. And so you not only motivated people today, you were inspirational, but there's an aspirational nature to your life so far, brother. And I'm in it now. If there's anything I can ever do for you to encourage you, to support you, to be there for you, I just want you to know I'm always that one phone Thank call, you, one text message away. This was a truly remarkable hour, brother. And I'm so grateful for it. I want everybody to go get your book. I want to say it again because we just do this stuff. Mission Possible, one-year devotional, 365 days of inspiration for pursuing your God-given purpose. You can go to timtebow.com and learn more about the Tebow, the Tim Tebow Foundation. And I just want you all listening to this today. Can you think of a human being you don't want to share this with? From a five-year-old young man or woman who's going to build their life to an 85-year-old person who's on the back nine and wants to be inspired as well. This was one of the all-time masterclass great conversations about life. It just truly was. So thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and yeah. for <laughs> just the time and um, for the impact that you're making. Yeah. Truly grateful. Brother. Thank you. First of many of these, I think. So, Let's do it, man. Hey, everybody. Let's do it. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I love you. I just uh, i am so grateful to have been present for this hour. Please share the show like I know you will. God bless you all. Max out your life.